Chapter 14 of Mr. Prohack by Arnold Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Mr. Prohack, Chapter 14. End of an Idle Day. 1. It is remarkable that even in the most fashionable shopping thoroughfares certain shops remain brilliantly open, exposing plush-cushioned wares under a glare of electricity in the otherwise darkened street, for an hour or so after neighbouring establishments have drawn down their blinds and put up their shutters. An interesting point of psychology is involved in this phenomenon. On his way home from the paradise of the mosque, Mr. Prohack, afoot and high-spirited, and energised by a long-forgotten sensation of physical well-being, called in at such a shop, and, with the minimum of parley, bought an article enclosed in a rich case. A swift and happy impulse on his part. The object was destined for his wife, and his intention in giving it was to help him to introduce more easily to her notice the fact that he was now, or would shortly be, worth over a quarter of a million of money. For he was a strange, silly fellow, and just as he had been conscious of a certain false shame at inheriting a hundred thousand pounds, so now he was conscious of a certain false shame at having increased his possessions to two hundred and fifty thousand pounds. The eagle was waiting in front of Mr. Prohack's door. He wondered what might be the latest evening project of his women, for he had not ordered the car so early. Perhaps the first night had been postponed. However, he was too discreet, or too dignified, to make any inquiry from the chauffeur, too indifferent to the projects of his beloved women. He would be quite content to sit at home by himself, reflecting upon the marvels of existence and searching among them for his soul. Within the house, servants were rushing about in an atmosphere of excitement and bell-ringing. He divined that his wife and daughter were dressing simultaneously for an important occasion, either the first night or something else. In that feverish environment he forgot the form of words which he had carefully prepared for the breaking to his wife of the great financial news. Fortunately, she gave him no chance to blunder. "'Oh, Arthur, Arthur!' she cried, sweetly reproachful, as with an assumed jauntiness he entered the bedroom. "'How late you are! I expected you back an hour ago at least. Your things are laid out in the boudoir. You haven't got a moment to spare. We're late as it is.' She was by no means dressed, and the bedroom looked as if it had been put to the sack. Nearly every jaw was ajar, and the two beds resembled a second-hand shop. Mr. Prohack's self-protective instinct at once converted him into a porcupine. An attempt was being made to force him into a hurry, and he loathed hurry. "'I'm not late,' said he, "'because I didn't say when I would return. It won't take me more than a quarter of an hour to eat, and we've got heaps of time for the theatre. "'I'm giving a little dinner in the Grand Babylon restaurant,' said Eve, "'and of course we must be there first. Sissy's arranged it for me on the phone. It'll be much more amusing than dining here, and it saves the servants.' Yet the woman had recently begun to assert that the servants had not enough to do. Ah, said Mr. Prohack, startled. And who are the guests? Oh, nobody. Only us uh, and Charlie, of course, and Oswald Morphy, and perhaps Lady Masculam. I've told Charlie to do the ordering. I should have thought that one meal per diem at the Grand Babylon would have been sufficient. But this is in the restaurant, don't I tell you? Oh, dear, that's three times I've tried to do my hair. It's always the same when I want it nice. Now do get along, Arthur. Strange, said he with a sardonic blitheness. Strange how it's always my fault when your hair goes wrong. And to himself he said, All right, all right, I just shan't inform you about that quarter of a million. You've no leisure for details tonight, my girl. And he went into the boudoir. His blissful serenity was too well established to be overthrown by anything short of a catastrophe. Nevertheless, it did quiver slightly under the shock of Eve's new tactics in life. This was the woman who, on only the previous night, had been inveighing against the ostentation of her son's career at the Grand Babylon. Now she seemed determined to rival him in showiness, to be the partner of his alleged vulgarity. That the immature sissy should suddenly drop the ideals of the new poor, the ideals of the new rich, was excusable, but Eve! But that modest embodiment of shy and quiet common sense, she who once had scorned the world of the daily picture, was more and more disclosing a desire for that world. 
And where now were her doubts about the righteousness of Charlie's glittering deeds? And where was the ancient sagacity which surely should have prevented her from being deceived by the superficialities of an Oswald Morphy? Was she blindly helping to prepare a disaster for her blind daughter? Was the explanation that she had tasted of the fruit? The horrid thought crossed Mr. Prohack's mind. All women are alike. He flung it out of his loyal mind, trying to substitute, All women, except Eve, are alike. But it came back in its original form. Not that he cared, really. If Eve had transformed herself into a Cleopatra, his ridiculous passion for her would have suffered no modification. Lying around the boudoir were various rectangular parcels, addressed in flowing calligraphy to himself, the first harvest loads of his busy morning. The sight of them struck his conscience. Was not he, too, following his wife on the path of the new ridge? No. As ever, he was blameless. He was merely executing the prescription of his doctor, who had expounded the necessity of scientific idleness and the curative effect of fine clothes on health. True, he knew himself to be cured, but if nature had chosen to cure him too quickly, that was not his fault. He heard his wife talking to Machin in the bedroom, and Machin talking to his wife, and the servant's voice was as joyous and as worried as if she herself, and not Eve, were about to give a little dinner at the Grand Babylon. Queer! Queer! The phrase, a quarter of a million, glinted and flashed in the circumambient air. But it was almost a meaningless phrase. He was like a sort of super-savage, and could not count beyond a hundred thousand. And quite unphilosophical, he forgot that the ecstasy produced by a hundred thousand had passed in a few days, and took for granted that the ecstasy produced by two hundred and fifty thousand would endure for ever. "'Take that thing off, please,' he commanded his wife, when he returned to the bedroom in full array. She was by no means complete, but she had achieved some progress, and was trying the effect of her garnet necklace. "'But it's the best I've got,' said she. "'No, it isn't,' he flatly contradicted her, and opened the case so newly purchased. "'Arthur!' she gasped, spellbound, entranced, enchanted. "'That's my name?' Pearls! But this must have cost thousands!' "'And what if it did?' he inquired placidly, clasping the thing with much delicacy round her neck. His own pleasure was intense, and yet he severely blamed himself. Indeed, he called himself a criminal. Scarcely could he meet her gaze when she put her hands on his shoulders, after a long gazing into the mirror. And when she kissed him, and said with frenzy that he was a dear and a madman, he privately agreed with her. She ran to the door. "'Where are you going? I must show Sissy.' "'Wait a minute, child. Do you know why I've bought that necklace? Because the affair with Spinner has come off.' He then gave her the figures. She observed, not unduly moved. "'But I knew that would be all right.' "'How did you know?' "'Because you're so clever. You always get the best of everybody.' He realised afresh that she was a highly disturbing woman. She uttered highly disturbing verdicts without thought and without warning. You never knew what she would say. "'I think,' he remarked, calmly pretending that she had said something quite obvious, "'that it would be as well for us not to breathe one word to anybody at all about this new windfall.' She eagerly agreed. "'But we must really begin to spend—I mean, spend regularly?' "'Yes, of course,' he admitted. "'Otherwise it would be absurd, wouldn't it?' "'Yes, of course.' Arthur? Yes. How much would it be in income? Well, I'm not going in for any more flutters. No, I've done absolutely with all speculating idiocies. Providence has watched over us. I take the hint. Therefore my investments will all have to be entirely safe and sound. No fancy rates of interest. I should say that by the time old Paul's fixed up my investments we shall have a bit over four hundred pounds a week coming in, if that's any guide to you. Arthur! Isn't it wicked? She examined afresh the necklace. By the time they were all three in the car, Mr. Prohack had become aware of the fact that in Sissy's view he ought to have bought two necklaces while he was about it. Sissy's trunks were on the roof of the car. She decided to take up residence at the Grand Babylon that very night. The rapidity and the uncontrollability of events made Mr. Prohack feel dizzy. I hope you brought some money, darling said his wife. Two. 
Lend me some money, will you? murmured Mr. Prohack lightly to his splendid son, after he had glanced at the bill for Eve's theatre dinner at the Grand Babylon. Mr. Brohack had indeed brought some money with him, but not enough. I haven't got any, said Charlie with equal lightness. Better give me the bill. I'll see to it. Whereupon Charlie signed the bill and handed the bowing waiter five ten shilling notes. That's not enough, said Mr. Brohack. Uh, not enough for the tip. Well, it'll have to be. I, I never give more than ten per cent. Mr. Brohack strove to conceal his own painful lack of worldliness. He had imagined that he had in his pockets heaps of money to pay for a meal for a handful of people. He was mistaken. That was all, and the incident had no importance, for a few pounds, more or less, could not matter in the least to a gentleman of his income. Yet he felt guilty of being a waster. He could not accustom himself to the scale of expenditure. Barely in the old days could he have earned in a week the price of the repast, consumed now in an hour. The vast apartment was packed with people living at just that rate of expenditure, and seeming to think naught of it. But do two wrongs make a right? he privately demanded of his soul. Then his soul came to the rescue with its robust common sense, and replied, well, Perhaps two wrongs don't make a right, but five hundred wrongs positively must make a right. And he felt better. And suddenly he understood the true function of the magnificent orchestra that dominated the scene. It was the function of a brass band at a quack dentist's booth in a fair, to drown the cries of the victims of the art of extraction. Yes, he reflected, full of health and carelessness, this is a truly great life. The party went off in two automobiles, his own and Lady Massuland's. Cars were fighting for room in front of the blazing façade of the Metropolitan Theatre, across which rose in fire the title of the entertainment, Smack Your Face together with the names of Asprey Chown and Eliza Fiddle. Car after car poured out a contingent of glorious girls and men, and was hustled off with ferocity by a row of gigantic and implacable commissionaires. Mr. Oswald Morphy walked straight into the building at the head of his guests. Highly expensive persons were humbling themselves at the little window of the box-office, but Ozzy held his course, and officials performed obeisances which stopped short only at falling flat on their faces at the sight of him. Tickets were not for him. "'This is a beautiful box,' said Eve to him, amused at the grandeur of the receptacle into which they had been ushered. "'It's Mr. Chown's own box.' "'Then isn't Mr. Chown to be here to-night?' "'No, he went to Paris this morning for a rest. The acting manager will telephone to him after each act. That's how he always does, you know.' "'When the cat's away, the mice will play,' thought Mr. Prohack uncomfortably, with the naughty sensations of a mouse. The huge auditorium was a marvellous scene of excited brilliance. As the stalls filled up, a burst of clapping came at intervals from the unseen pit. "'What are they clapping for?' said the simple Eve, who, like Mr. Prohack, had never been to a first night before, to say nothing of such a super first night as this. "'Oh!' replied Ozzy negligently. Someone they know by sight just come into the stalls. The chic thing in the pit is to recognise and to share by applause that you have recognised. The one that applauds the oftenest wins the game in the pit. At those words and their tone, Mr. Pro had looked at Ozzy with a new eye, as who should be thinking, Is Sissy right about this fellow, after all? Sissy sat down modestly and calmly next to her mother. Nobody could guess from her apparently ingenuous countenance that she knew that she, and not the terror of the departments and his wife, was the originating cause of Mr. Morphy's grandiose hospitality. "'I suppose the stalls are full of celebrities,' said Eve. "'They are full of people who have paid twice the ordinary price for their seats,' answered Ozzy. "'Who's that extraordinary old red-haired woman in the box opposite?' Eve demanded. "'Oh, that's Enid.' "'Enid?' "'Yes, you know the Enid Stove, don't you? "'All ladies know the Enid Stove. "'It's been a household word for forty years. "'That's the original Enid. "'Her father invented the stove and named it after her when she was a girl. "'She never misses the first night.' "'How extraordinary! "'Is she what you call a celebrity?' "'No, rather. "'Now,' said Mr. Pragg, "'now at last I understand the real meaning of fame.' "'But that's Charlie down there!' exclaimed Eve suddenly 
pointing to the stalls, and then looking behind her to see if there was not another Charlie in the box. "'Yes,' Ozzy agreed. "'Lady Maskelyne has an extra stall, and as five's a bit of a crowd in this spot, I, I thought he'd told you.' "'He had not,' said Eve. The curtain went up, and this simple gesture on the part of the curtain evoked enormous applause. The audience could not control the expression of its delight. A young lady under a sunshade appeared. The mere fact of her existence threw the audience into a new ecstasy. An old man with a red nose appeared. Similar demonstrations from the audience. When these two had talked to each other and sung to each other, the applause was triple, and when the scene changed from Piccadilly Circus at 4 a.m. to the interior of a Spanish palace inhabited by illustrious French actors and actresses who proceeded to play an act of a tragedy by Corneille, the applause was quintupled. At the end of the tragedy, the applause was decupled. Then the Spanish palace dissolved into an Abyssinian harem, and Eliza Fiddle in Abyssinian costume was discovered lying upon two thousand cushions of two thousand colours, and the audience rose at Eliza, and Eliza rose at the audience, and the resulting frenzy was the sublimest frenzy that ever shook a theatre. The piece was stopped dead for three minutes, while the audience and Eliza protested a mutual and unique passion. From this point onwards, Mr. Prowack lost his head. He ran to and fro in the bewildering, glittering maze of the piece, seeking for an explanation, for a signpost, for a clue, for the slightest hint and found nothing. They went by strangely narrow corridors and through iron doors across the stage, whose white-sleeved ragged population seemed to be behaving as though the last trump had sounded, and so upstairs and along a broad passage, full of doors ajar, from which issued whispers and exclamations and transient visions of young women. From the star's dressing-room at the end, a crowd of all sorts and conditions of person was, was being pushed. Mr. Brahack trembled with an awful apprehension, and asked himself vainly what in the name of common sense he was doing there, and prayed that Ozzy might be refused admission. The next moment he had been introduced to a middle-aged woman in a middle-aged dressing-gown. Her face was thickly caked with paint and powder, her eyes surrounded with rings of deepest black, her fingernails red. Mr. Brahack, not without difficulty, recognised Eliza. A dresser stood on either side of her. Blinding showers of electric light poured down upon her defenceless but hardy form. She shook hands, for Mr. Brahack deemed that she ought to bear a notice. Danger. Visitors are requested not to touch. "'So good of you to come round,' she said, in her rich and powerful voice, smiling with all her superb teeth. Mr. Brahack, entranced, gazed not as at a woman, but as at a public monument. Nevertheless, she thought that she was not a bad kind, and well suited for the rough work of the world. "'I hope you're all coming to my ball to-night,' said she. Mr. Brack had never heard of any ball. In an instant she told him that she had remarked two most charming ladies with him in the box. "'In order to faculty of observation,' mused Mr. Brack. And in another instant she was selling him three two-guinea tickets for a grand ball and rout, in aid of the West End Chorus Girls' Aid Association. Could he refuse, perceiving so clearly as he did, that within the public monument was hiding a wistful creature, human like himself, human like his wife and daughter? He could not. "'Now you'll come,' said she. Mr. Perhack swore that he would come, his heart sinking as he realised the consequence of his own foolish weakness. There was a knock at the door. "'Did you want me, Liza?' said a voice, and a fat gentleman, clothed with resplendent correctness, stepped into the room. It was the stage manager, a god in his way. Eliza Fiddle became a cyclone. "'I should think I did want you,' she said passionately. "'That's why I sent for you, and next time I'll ask you to come quicker. I'm not going to have that squint-eyed girl on the stage any more to-night. You know, the one at the end of the row. Twice she spoiled my exit by getting in the way.' "'And you've got to throw her out and take it from me. "'She does it on purpose.' "'I, I can't throw her out without Mr. Jones's orders, "'and Mr. Jones in Paris.' "'Then you refuse?' "'A pause. Uh, "'Yes.' "'Then I'm not going on again tonight. "'Not if I know it. "'I'm not going to be insulted in my own theatre.' 
It's not the girl's fault. You, you know you haven't got room to move. I don't know anything about that, and I don't care. All I know is that I've finished with that squint-eyed woman, and you can choose right now between her and me, and so that's that. Miss Fiddle's fragile complexion had approached to within six inches of the stage manager's broad and shiny features, and it had little resemblance to any of the various faces which audiences associated with the figure of Eliza Fiddle. It was a face voluptuously distorted by the violence of emotion. As Miss Fiddle appeared in to be under the impression that she was alone with the stage manager, Mr. Bragg rendered justice to that impression by softly departing. Ozzy followed. The stage manager also followed. "'Where are you going?' they heard Eliza's voice behind them addressing the stage manager. I I "'I'm going to tell your understudy to get ready quick.' An enormous altercation uprose, and faces peeped from every door in the corridor. But Mr. Prohack stayed not. Ozzy led him to Mr. Asprey Chown's private room. The terror of the departments was shaking. Ozzy laughed gently as he shut the door. "'What will happen?' asked Mr. Prahack, affecting a gaiety he did not feel. "'What do you think will happen?' simpered Ozzy blandly. "'Having due regard to the fact that Miss Fiddle had to choose between three hundred and fifty pounds a week and a lawsuit with Chown involving heavy damages? <laughs> I must say there's nobody like Blags for keeping these three hundred and fifty pound a week individuals in order. Chown would sooner lose forty of them than lose Blags. And Eliza knows it. By the way, what do you think of the show?' Uh, uh, will it succeed? Ah, uh, you should see the advance booking. With a thousand pounds in the house tonight, Clown will be clearing fifteen hundred a week when he's paid off his production. Well, it's marvellous. You don't mean the show? Uh, no, no, the profit. I agree, said Podozzi. I'm beginning to like this sizzling idiot, thought Mr. Brohack, as it were, regretfully. They left the imperial riches of Mr. Chown's private room, like brothers. Four. When Mr. Rohack touched the handle of the door of the box, he felt as though he were returning to civilization. He felt less desolated by the immediate past and by the prospect of the immediate future. He was yearning for the society of mere women after his commerce with a star at three hundred and fifty pounds a week. True, he badly wanted to, to examine his soul and inquire into his philosophy of life, but he was prepared to postpone that inquest until the society of mere women had had a beneficial effect on him. Charlie, who had been paying a state visit to his mother and sister, was just leaving the box, and the curtain was just going up. "'Hello, Dad,' said the youth. "'You are the very man I was looking for.' And he drew his father out into the corridor. "'You've got two of the finest ballroom dancers I ever saw,' he added to Ozzy. "'Haven't we?' Ozzy concurred with faint enthusiasm. "'But the rest of the show,' Charlie went on Rufus, "'well, if chance shows were only equal to his showmanship, <laughs> only they aren't. Ozzy raised his eyebrows, a skilful gesture that at once defended his employer and agreed with Charles. By the way, Dad, I've got a house for you. I've told the motor about it, and she's going to see it tomorrow morning. A uh, house? Mr. Prague exclaimed weakly, foreseeing new vistas of worry. <laughs> I've got one. I, I can't live in two. But this one's a house. You know about it, don't you, Morphy? Ozzy gave a nod and a vague smile. See here, Dad, come out here a minute. Ozzy discreetly entered the box and closed the door. What is it? asked Mr. Bragg. It's this, Charlie replied, handing his parent a cheque. I've deducted what I paid for you tonight from what you lent me not long since. I've calculated interest on the loan at ten per cent. You can get ten practically anywhere in these days, worse luck. "'But I don't want this, my boy,' Mr. Prohack protested, holding the cheque as he might have held a lady's handkerchief retrieved from the ground. "'Well, I'm quite sure I don't,' said Charlie, a little stiffly. There was a pause. "'As you please,' said Mr. Prohack, putting the cheque, interest and all, into his pocket. "'Thanks,' said Charlie. "'Much obliged. You're a noble father, and I shouldn't be a bit surprised if you've laid the plantation of my fortunes. But, of course, you never know in my business.' "'What is your business?' Mr. Prohack asked, timidly, almost apologetically. He made up his mind on the previous evening that he would talk to Charlie, as a father ought to talk to a son, that is to say, like a cross-examining barrister and a moralist combined. 
he decided that it was not more than his right, it was his duty to do so. But now the right, if not the duty, seemed less plain, and he remembered what he had said to Eve concerning the right attitude of parents to, to children. And chiefly he remembered that Charlie was not in his debt. "'I am a buyer and seller. I, I buy for less than I sell for. That's how I live.' "'It appears to be profitable.' "'Yes, I made over ten thousand in Glasgow, buying an option on an engineering business, with your money, from people who wanted to get rid of it, and then selling what I hadn't paid for to people in London who wanted to get hold of an engineering business up there. <laughs> seems simple enough, and the only reason everybody isn't doing it is that it isn't as simple as it seems. At least it's simple, but there's a knack in it. I found out I've got the knack through my little deals in motorbikes and things. As a matter of fact, I, I didn't find out. "'Someone told me, and I began to think. "'But don't be alarmed if I go bust. "'I'm on to a much bigger option now, in the city. "'Oh, very much bigger. "'If it comes off, you'll see. "'Lady Matulum is keen on it, and she's something of a judge. "'Any remarks?' "'Mr. Brohack looked cautiously at the young man, "'his own creation, to whom, only the other day, as it seemed, he be in the habit of giving one pound per school term for pocket money. And he was affrighted, not by what he had created, but by the astounding possibilities of fatherhood, which suddenly presented itself to him as a most dangerous pursuit. "'No remarks,' said he briefly. What remarks indeed could he offer? Wildly guessing at the truth about his son in that conversation with Eve on the previous evening, he had happened to guess right and his sermon to Eve prevented now the issue of remarks. "'Oh, of course!' Charlie burst out. "'You can't tell me anything I don't know already. I'm a parrot. I'm not producing. All the money I make is to be earned by somebody else before I get hold of it. I'm not doing any good to my beautiful country. But I did try to find a useful job, didn't I? My beautiful country wouldn't have me. It only wanted me in the trenches. Well, it's got to have me.' "'I don't know, we'll make it pay now. "'I'll squeeze every penny out of it. "'I'll teach it a lesson.' "'Why not? "'I should only be shoving its own ideas down its throat. "'Supposing I hadn't got this knack, and I hadn't had you. "'I might have been wearing all my ribbons "'and playing a barrel-organ in Oxford Street today, "'instead of living at the Grand Babylon.' "'You're becoming quite eloquent in your old age,' "'said Mr. Prohack, tremulously jocular while looking with alarm into his paternal heart. Was not he himself a pirate? Had not the hundred and fifty thousand that was coming to him had to be earned by somebody else? Money did not make itself. Well, retorted Charlie, with a grim smile, that's one thing to be said for me. When I do talk, I talk. And so at last he begun to read, "'I'm not going to be the ordinary millionaire. No fear. Make your mind easy on that point. Besides, reading isn't so bad after all.' "'And what about that house you were speaking of? You aren't going to plant any of your options on me?' "'Oh, we'll discuss that tomorrow. I must get back to my seat,' said Charlie firmly, moving away. "'So long.' "'I say,' Mr. Brohack summoned him to return, "'I'm rather curious about the methods of you millionaires. Just when did you sign that cheque for me?' You only lent me the money as we were leaving the hotel. Oh, I made it out while I was talking to the mater and sis in your box, of course. How simple are the acts of genius after they're accomplished, observed Mr. Brohack. Naturally you signed it in the box. As he rejoined his family, he yawned, surprising himself. He began to feel a mysterious fatigue, the effect of the Turkish bath, without doubt. The remainder of the evening stretched out in front of him, interminably tedious. The title of the play was misleading. He could not smack his face. He wished to heaven he could. And then after the play, the ball. Eliza might tell him to dance with her. She would be quite capable of such a deed. And by universal convention her suggestions were the equivalent of demands. Nobody who ever could or would refuse to dance with Eliza. There she was, all her four limbs superbly displayed, sweetly smiling with her enormous mouth, just as if the relations between Blags and herself were those of Paul and Virginia. The excited old audience, in the professional phrase, was eating her. 5. 
Mr. Bragg really was a most absurd person. Smack your face, when it came to an end, towards midnight, had established itself as an authentic, enormous success. And because Mr. Prohack did not care for it, because it bored him, because he found it vulgar and tedious and expensive, because it tasted in his mouth like a dust-and-ashes sandwich, the fellow actually felt sad. He felt even bitter. He hated to see the fashionable and splendid audience unwilling to leave the theatre, cheering one super-favourite, five arch-favourites, and fifteen favourites, and cheering them again and again, and sending the curtain up and down and up and down time after time. He could not bear that what he detested should be deliriously admired. He went so far as to form views about the decadence of the theatre as an institution. Most of all, he was disgusted, because his beloved Eve was not disgusted. Eve said placidly that she did not think much of the affair, but that she had thoroughly enjoyed it and wouldn't mind coming on the next night to see it afresh. He said gloomily, and I'm bringing you up for nearly twenty-five years. As for Sissy, she was quietly and sternly enthusiastic about a lot of the dancing. She announced her judgment as an expert, and Charlie agreed with her, and there was no appeal, and Mr. Brohack had the air of an ignorant outsider whose opinions were negligible. Further, he was absurd in that, though he assuredly had no desire whatever to go to the dance, he fretted at the delay in getting there. Even when they had all got out to the porch of the theatre, he exhibited a controlled but intense impatience, because Charlie did not produce the car instantly from amid the confused hordes of cars that waited in the surrounding streets. Moreover, as regards the ball, he had foolishly put himself in a false position, for he was compelled to pretend that he had purchased the tickets because he personally wanted to go to the ball. Had he not been learning to dance? Now the fact was, that he looked forward to the ball with terror. He had never performed publicly. He proceeded from one pretense to another. When Charlie stated curtly that he, Charlie, was going to no ball, he feigned disappointment, saying that Charlie ought to go for his sister's sake. Yet he was greatly relieved at Charlie's departure, even in Lady Massillon's car. He could not stomach the notion of Charlie cynically watching his infant steps on the polished, treacherous floor. In the matter of Charlie, Oswald Morphy also feigned disappointment, but for a different reason. Ozzy wanted to have Sissy as much as possible to himself. Mr. Brohack yawned in the car. "'You're overtired, Arthur. It's the Turkish bath,' said Eve, with commiseration. This was a bad enough mistake on her part, but she worsened it by adding, "'Perhaps the wisest thing would be for us all to go home.' Mr. Prohack was extremely exhausted, and would have given his head to go home. But so odd, so contrary, so deceitful, and so silly was his nature, that he replied, "'Darling, where on earth did you get these ideas from? There's nothing like a Turkish bath for stimulating you, and I'm not at all tired. Never felt better in my life. But the atmosphere of that theatre would make anybody yawn.' The ball was held in a picture-gallery, where an exhibition of the International Portrait Society was in progress. The crush of cars at the portals was as keen as that at the portals of the Metropolitan. And all the persons who got out of the cars seemed as fresh as if they had just got out of bed. Mr. Brahack was astonished at the vast number of people who didn't care what time they went to bed because they didn't care what time they arose. He was in danger of being morbidly obsessed by the extraordinary prevalence of idleness. The rooms were full of brilliant idlers in all colours, Everybody, except Chorus Girls, had thought fit to appear at this ball in aid of that admirable charity, Chorus Girls Aid Association. And, as everybody was also on the walls, the dancers had to compete with their portraits, a competition in which many of them were well beaten. After they had visited the supper-room, where both Sissy and her mother did wonderful seats of degustation, and Mr. Brohack drank all that was good for him, Sissy ordered her father to dance with her. He refused. She went off with Ozzy, while her parents sat side by side on gold chairs, like ancestors. Sissy repeated her command, and Mr. Brahack was about to disobey, when Eliza Fiddle dawned upon the assemblage. The supernatural creature had been rehearsing until 3 a.m., 
she had been trying on clothes from 9 a.m. until 5 p.m. She had borne the chief weight of smack your face on her unique shoulders for nearly three hours and a half. She had changed into an unforgettable black ball dress, cut to demonstrate in the clearest fashion that her shoulders had suffered no harm. And here she was, as fresh as Aphrodite from the foam. She immediately set herself to bear the chief weight of the ball on those same defenceless shoulders, for she was, in theory at any rate, the leading organiser of the affair, and, according to the entire press, it was her ball. As soon as he saw her, Mr. Perhack had a most ridiculous fear lest she should pick him out for a dance, and to protect himself, he said, All right, to his daughter. A fox-trot announced itself. In his own drawing-room, with the door locked, Mr. Prohack could and did treat Sir Fox Trot as child's play. But now he realised that he had utterly forgotten every movement of the infernal thing. Agony, as he stood up and took his daughter's hand, an awful conviction that everybody, who was anybody, was staring to witness the terror of the departments trying to jazz in public for the first time a sick, sinking fear lest some of his old colleagues from the Treasury might be lurking in corners to guy him. Agony, as he collected himself, and swayed his body slightly to catch the rhythm of the tune. Where in heaven's name was the first beat in the bar? Walk first, said Sissy professionally. He was in motion. Now, said Sissy, one, two, one, two. Miraculously, he was dancing. It was as though the whole room was shouting, They're off! Sissy steered him. "'Don't look at your feet,' said she sharply. And like a schoolboy, he chucked his chin obediently up. Then he was steering her. Although her feet were the reverse of enormous, he somehow could not keep off them. But that girl was made of hardy stuff and never winced. He was doing better. Pride was puffing him. Yet he desired the music to stop. The music did stop. "'Thanks,' he breathed. "'Oh, no,' said she, "'that's not all.' The dancers clapped, and the orchestra resumed. He started again. Couples surged round him, and sometimes he avoided them, and sometimes he did not. Then he saw a head bobbing not far away, as if it were one cork and he another on a choppy sea. It resembled Eve's head. It was Eve's head. She was dancing with Oswald Morphy. He never supposed that Eve could dance these new dances. "'Let's stop,' said he. "'Certainly not,' Sissy forbade. "'We must finish it.' He finished it, rather breathless and dizzy. He had lived through it. "'You're perfectly wonderful, Arthur,' said Eve, when they met. "'Oh, no, I'm no good.' "'I was frightfully nervous about you at first, said Sissy. He said briefly, "'Oh, you needn't have been. I wasn't.' A little later Eve said to him, "'Aren't you going to ask me to dance, Arthur?' Dancing with Eve was not quite like dancing with Sissy, but they safely survived deadly perils, and Mr. Prohack perspired in a very healthy fashion. "'You dance really beautifully, dear,' said Eve, benevolently smiling. After that he cut himself free and roamed about. He wanted to ask Eliza Fiddle to dance, and also he didn't want to ask her to dance. However, he had apparently ceased to exist for her. Ozzy had introduced him to several radiant young creatures, he wanted to ask them to dance, but he dared not. And he was furious with himself. To dance with one's daughter and wife was well enough in its way, but it was not the real thing. It was without salt. One or two of the radiances glanced at him with inviting eyes, but no, he dared not face it. He grew gloomy, gloomier. He thought angrily, All this is not for me. I'm a middle-aged fool, and I've known it all along. Life lost its savour and became repugnant. Fatigue punished him, and simultaneously reduced two hundred and fifty thousand pounds to the value of about fourpence. It was Eve who got him away. Home, he called to Carthew, after Eve and Sissy had said goodbyes to Ozzy and stowed themselves into the car. Excuse me, said Sissy, you have to deliver me at the Grand Babylon first. He had forgotten. This detour was the cutest torture of the night. He could no longer bear not to be in bed. And when, after endless nocturnal miles, he did finally get home and into bed, he sighed as one taken off the rack. Ah, the delicious contact with the pillow! 
6. But there are certain persons who, although their minds are logical enough, have illogical bodies. Mr. Prohack was one of these. His ridiculous physical organism, as he once informed Dr. Viga, was least capable of going to sleep when it was most fatigued. If Mr. Prohack's body had retired to bed four hours earlier than in fact it did, Mr. Prohack would have slept instantly and with ease. Now, despite delicious contact with the pillow, he could not get off and his mind, influenced by his body, grew restless, then excited, then distressingly realistic. His mind began to ask fundamental questions, questions not a bit original, but nonetheless very awkward. "'You've had your first idle day, Mr. Prohack,' said his mind challengingly, instead of composing itself to slumber. "'It was organised on scientific lines. It was carried out with conscientiousness. And look at you, and look at me.' You've had a few good moments, as, for example, at the Turkish bath, but do you want a succession of such days? Could you survive a succession of such days? Would you even care to acquire a hundred and fifty thousand pounds every day? You've eaten too much, and drunk too much, and run too hard after pleasure, and been too much bored, and met too many antipathetic people, and squandered too much money, and set a thoroughly bad example to your family. You've been happy only in spasms. Your health is good, you are cured of your malady. Does that render you any more contented? It does not. You have complicated your existence in the hope of improving it. But have you improved it? No. You ought to simplify your existence. But will you? You will not. All your strength of purpose will be needed to prevent still further complications being woven into your existence. To inherit a hundred thousand pounds was your misfortune but deliberately to increase the sum to a quarter of a million was your fault. You were happier at the Treasury. You left the Treasury on account of illness. You are not ill any more. Will you go back to the Treasury? No, you will never go back, because your powerful common sense tells you that to return to the Treasury with an income of twenty thousand a year would be grotesque. And, rather than be grotesque, you would suffer. Again, rightly. Nothing is worse than to be grotesque. Further, said his mind, you have started your son on a sinister career of adventure that may end in calamity. You have ministered to your daughter's latent frivolity. You have put temptations in the way of your wife which she cannot withstand. You have developed yourself into a waster. What is the remedy? Obviously, to dispose of your money. But your ladies would not permit you to do so and they are entitled to be heard on the point. Moreover, how could you dispose of it? Not in charity, because you are convinced of the grave social mischiefness of charity, and not in helping any great social movement, because you are not silly enough to know that the lavishing of wealth never really aids, but most viciously hinders, the proper evolution of a society. And you cannot save your income and let it accumulate, because if you did you would once again be tumbling into the grotesque. And you would, further, be leaving to your successors a legacy of evil, which no man is justified in leaving to his successors. No, your case is in practice irremediable. Like the murderer on the scaffold, you are the victim of circumstances, and not one human being in a million will pity you. You are a living tragedy which only death can end. During this disconcerting session, Eve had been mysteriously engaged in the boudoir. She now came into the dark bedroom. What? she softly murmured, hearing Mr. Prohack's restlessness. Not asleep, darling. She bent over him and kissed him, and her kiss was even softer, more soporific than her voice. Now do go to sleep. And Mr. Prohack went to sleep. And his last waking thought was, with the feel of the kiss on his nose, the poor woman had aimed badly in the dark. Anyway, this tragedy has one compensation, of which a hundred quarter of a millions can't deprive me. End of chapter 14。Chapter 15 of Mr. Bennett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Simon Evers. Mr. Prohack, chapter 15 the heavy father. 1. 
Within a few moments of his final waking up the next morning, Mr. Prohack beheld Eve bending over him, the image of solicitude. She was dressed for outdoor business. "'How do you feel?' she asked, in a tender tone that demanded to know the worst at once. "'Why?' asked Mr. Prohack, thus with one word and a smile to match, criticising her tone. "'You looked so dreadfully tired last night. I did feel sorry for you, darling. Don't you think you'd better stay in bed today? "'Can you seriously suggest such a thing?' he cried. "'What about my daily programme if I stay in bed? I have undertaken to be idle, and nobody can be scientifically idle in bed. I am late already. Where is my breakfast? Where are my newspapers? I must begin the day without the loss of another moment. Please give me my dressing-gown.' "'I very much wonder how your blood pressure is,' Eve complained. "'And you, I suppose, are perfectly well?' "'Oh, yes, I am. I am absolutely cured. Dr. Vega is really very marvellous. But I always told you he was.' "'Well,' said Mr. Prohack, "'what's sauce for the goose has to be sauce for the gander. If you're perfectly well, so am I. You can't have the monopoly of health in this marriage. What's that pamphlet you've got in your hand, my dove?' "'Oh, it's nothing. It's only about the League of All the Arts. Mr. Morphy gave it to me.' I suppose it was that pamphlet you were reading last night in the boudoir, instead of coming to bed. Eve, you're hiding something from me. Where are you going to in such a hurry? I'm not hiding anything, you silly boy. I thought I'd just run along and have a look at that house. You see, if it isn't at all the kind of thing to suit us, me going first will save you the trouble of going. What house? exclaimed Mr. Prohack with terrible emphasis. But Charlie told me he told you all about it. Eve protested innocently. "'Charlie told you no such thing,' Mr. Prohack contradicted her. "'If he told you anything at all, he merely told you that he'd mentioned a house to me in the most casual manner.' Eve proceeded blandly. "'It's in Manchester Square, very handy for the Wallace Gallery, and you know how fond you are of pictures. It's on sale, furniture and all, but it can be rented for a year to see how it suits us. Of course, it may not suit us a bit. I understand it has some lovely rooms.' Charlie says it would be exactly the thing for big receptions. Big receptions? I shall have nothing to do with it. Now we've lost our children, even this house is too big for us. And I know what the houses in Manchester Square are. You said all your life you hate receptions. So I do. There's so much trouble. But one never knows what may happen, and with plenty of servants. You understand me? I shall have nothing to do with it. Nothing. Darling, please, please don't excite yourself. The decision will rest entirely with you. You know I shouldn't dream of influencing you, as if I could. However, I've promised to meet Charlie there this morning, so I suppose I'd better go. Carthy was late with the car. She tapped her foot. Yet I specially told him to be here prompt. Well, considering the hour he brought us home, he scarcely had time to get into bed yet. He ought to have had the morning off. Why? A chauffeur's a chauffeur, after all. They know what they have to do. Besides, Carthy would do anything for me. Yes, that's you all over. You deliberately bewitch him, and then you shamelessly exploit him. I shall compare notes with Carthy. I can give him a useful tip or two about you. Oh, here he is, said Eve, who had been watching out of the window. Au revoir, my pet. Here's Machin with your breakfast and newspapers. I dare say I shall be back before you're up, but don't count on me. As he raised himself against pillows for the meal, after both she and Machin had gone, Mr. Prohack remembered what his mind had said to him a few hours earlier about fighting against further complications of his existence, and he set his teeth, and determined to fight hard. Scarcely had he begun his breakfast when Eve returned in a state of excitement. "'There's a young woman downstairs waiting for you in the dining-room. She wouldn't give her name to Machin, it seems, but she says she's your new secretary. Apparently she recognised my car on the way from the garage and stopped it and got into it and then she found out she'd forgotten something, and the car had to go back with her to where she lives, wherever that is, and that's why Carthy was late for me. Eve delivered these sentences with a tremendous air of ordinariness, as though they related quite usual events and disturbances, and as though no wife could possibly see in them any matter for astonishment or reproach. Such was one of her methods of making an effect. Mr. Brohack collected himself. On several occasions during the previous afternoon and evening he had meditated somewhat uneasily upon the domestic difficulties which might inhere in this impulsive engagement of Miss Winstock as a private secretary. But since waking up 
the affair had not presented itself to his mind. He had, indeed, completely forgotten it. "'Who told you all this?' he asked warily. "'Well, she told Machin, and Machin told me.' "'Let me see now,' said Mr. Prairigat. "'Yes, it's quite true. After ordering a pair of braces yesterday of morning, I did order a secretary. She was recommended to me.' "'You didn't say anything about it yesterday.' "'Mind I've had I a chance to do so? Had we a single moment together? And you know how I was when we reached home, don't you? You see, I always had a secretary at the Treasury, and I feel sort of lost without one, so I—' "'But, darling, of course. I always believe in letting you do exactly as you like. It's the only way. Au revoir, my pet. Charlie will be frightfully angry with me.' And then at the door. "'If she hasn't got anything to do, she can always see to the flowers for me. Perhaps when I come back you'll introduce us.' As soon as he had heard the bang of the front door, Mr. Prayhack rang his bell. Uh, "'Machin, I understand that my secretary is waiting in the dining-room.' "'Yes, sir.' "'Ask her to take her things off, and then bring her up here.' "'Up here, sir.' "'That's right.' In seven movements of unimaginable stealthy swiftness, Machin tidied the worst disorders of the room, and departed. Mr. Prayhack continued his breakfast. Miss Winstock appeared with a small portable typewriter in her arms, and a notebook lodged on the typewriter. She was wearing a smart black skirt and a smart white blouse with a high collar. In her unsullied freshness of attire she somewhat resembled a stage secretary on a first night. She might have been mistaken for a brilliant imitation of a real secretary. 2. "'Good morning. Say you're come,' Mr. Crowhack greeted her firmly. "'Oh, good morning. Yes, Mr. Crowhack. "'Well, put that thing down on a chair somewhere.' Machin also had entered the room. She handed a paper to Mr. Prohack. "'Mistress asked me to give you that, sir.' It was a lengthy description, typewritten, of a house in Manchester Square. Uh, "'Pass me those matches, please,' said Mr. Prohack to Mimi when they were alone. "'By the way, why wouldn't you give your name when you arrived?' "'Because I didn't know what it was.' "'Didn't know what it was?' "'When I told you my Christian name yesterday, you said it wouldn't do at all, and I was never to mention it again. In the absence of definite instructions about my surname, I thought I'd better pursue a cautious policy of waiting. I've told the chauffeur that he'll know my name in due course, and that until I tell him what it is, he mustn't know it. I was not sure whether you would wish the members of your household to know that I'm the person who had a collision with your car. Mrs. Prohack and I were both in a state of collapse after the accident, and I was removed before she could see me.' therefore she did not recognise me this morning. But on the other hand, she has no doubt heard my name often enough since the accident, and would recognise that. Mr. Prohack lit the first cigarette of the day. "'Why did you bring that typewriter?' he asked gravely. "'It's mine. I thought that if you didn't happen to have one here, it might be useful. It was the typewriter that the car had to go back for. I'd forgotten it. I can take it away again. But if you like, you can either buy it or, or hire it from me.' The girl could not have guessed it from his countenance, but Mr. Prohack was thunderstruck. She was bringing forward considerations which positively had not presented themselves to him. That she had much initiative was clear from her conduct of the previous day. She now disclosed a startling capacity for intrigue. Mr. Prohack, however, was not intimidated. The experience of an official life had taught him the value of taciturnity, and moreover a comfortable feeling of satisfaction stole over him as he realised that once again he had a secretary under his thumb. He seemed to be delightfully resuming the habits which ill-health had so ruthlessly broken. "'Mary Warburton,' said he at length. "'Certainly,' said she. "'I'll tell your chauffeur. "'The initials will correspond, in case.' "'Yes,' she said. "'I noticed that. "'We will see what your typewriting machine is capable of, "'and then I'll decide about it.' "'Certainly.' "'Please take down some letters.' "'Mr. Carroquire also told me what he wanted said, and I wrote the letters myself.' "'That is very interesting,' said Mr. Prohack. "'Perhaps you can manage to sit at the dressing-table. Uh, "'Mind that necklace there. It's supposed to be rather valuable. "'Put it in the case, and put the case in the middle drawer.' "'Don't you keep it in a safe?' said Miss Warburton, obeying. "'All questions about necklaces should be addressed directly to Mrs. Prohack.' "'I prefer to take down on my knee,' said Miss Warburton, opening her notebook, "'if I am to take down.' "'You are. Now, 
Uh, dear madam, I am requested by my lord of the treasury to forward to you the enclosed cheque for one hundred pounds for your privy purse. New line. I am also to state that no account of expenditure will be required. New line. Be good enough to acknowledge receipt, your obedient servant, to Miss Prohack, Grand Babylon Hotel. Got it? Dear sir, with reference to the action instituted by your company against Miss Mimi Winstock and to my claim against your company under my accident policy, I have seen the defendant. She has evidently behaved in an extremely foolish, not to say criminal way, but as the result of a personal appeal from her, I have decided to settle the matter privately. Please therefore accept this letter as a release from all your liabilities to me, and also as my personal undertaking to pay all the costs of the action on both sides. Yours faithfully. Secretary, World's Car Insurance Corporation. Wipe your eyes, wipe your eyes, Miss Warburton. You're wetting the notebook. I was only crying because you're so kind. I know I did behave in a criminal way. Uh, just so, Miss Warburton, but it will be more convenient for me, and for you too, if you can arrange to cry in your own time and not in mine. And he continued to address her in his own mind. Don't think I haven't noticed your aspiring nose, and your ruthless little lips, and your gift for conspiracy, and your wonderful weakness for tears. And don't confuse me with Mr. Carroll Quire, because we're two quite different people. You've got to be useful to me. And in a more remote part of his mind he continued still further, You're quite a decent sort of child, only you've been spoilt. I'll unspoil you. You've taken your first medicine rather well. I like you, or I shall like you before I've done with you. Miss Warburton wiped her eyes. You understand, Mr. Prohack proceeded aloud, that you're engaged as my confidential secretary, and when I say confidential, I mean confidential in the fullest sense. Oh, quite, Miss Warburton concurred almost passionately. And you aren't anybody else's secretary but mine. You may pretend to be everybody else's secretary. You may pretend as much as you please. It may even be advisable to do so. But the fact must almost remain that you are mine alone. You have to protect my interests, and let me warn you that my interests are sometimes very strange, not to say peculiar. Get well into your head that there are not ten commandments in my service, there is only one. To watch over my interests, to protect them from everybody else in the whole world. In return for a living wage, you give me the most absolute loyalty, a loyalty which sticks at nothing, nothing, nothing. Oh, Mr. Prohack, replied Mary Warburton, smiling simply. You needn't tell me all that. I entirely understand. It's a usual thing for confidential secretaries, isn't it? And now, Mr. Prohack went on, ignoring her, this being made perfectly clear, go into the boudoir, uh, that's the room there, and bring me here all the parcels lying about. Our next task is to check the accuracy of several of the leading tradesmen in the West End. I think there are one or two more parcels that have been delivered this morning in the hall, said Miss Warburton. Perhaps I'd better fetch them. Perhaps you had. In a few minutes, Miss Warburton, by dint of opening parcels, had transformed the bedroom into a composite of the principal men's shops in Piccadilly and Bond Street. Mr. Prohack recoiled before the chromatic show, and also before the prospect of Eve's view on the show. "'Take everything into the boudoir,' said he, "'and arrange them under the sofa. It's important that we should not lose our heads in this crisis. When you go out to lunch you will buy some foolscap paper.' and this afternoon you will make a schedule of the goods, divided according to the portions of the human frame which they intended to conceal or adorn. What are you laughing at, Miss Warburton? You are so amusing, Mr. Prohack. I may be amusing, but I am not susceptible to the flattery of giggling. Endeavour not to treat serious subjects lightly. I don't see any boots. Neither do I. You will telephone to the bootmakers and to my tailors. Also to Sir Paul Spinner and Messrs. Smathe and Smathe. Uh, but before that, I will just dictate a few more letters. Certainly. When he had finished dictating, Mr. Prohack said, I shall now get up. Go downstairs and ask Machin, uh, that's the parlour-maid, to show you the breakfast-room. The breakfast-room is behind the dining-room and is so called because it is never employed for breakfast. It exists in all truly London houses and is perfectly useless in all of them except those occupied by dentists who use it for their beneficent labours in taking things from, or adding things to, the bodies of their patients. The breakfast-room in this house will be 
the secretary's room. Your room, if you continue to give me satisfaction. Remove that typewriting machine from here, and arrange your room according to your desire. And I say, Miss Warburton— Yes, Mr. Prohack, eagerly responded the secretary, pausing at the door. Yesterday I gave you a brief outline of your duties, but I omitted one exceedingly important item, almost as important as not falling in love with my son. You will have to keep on good terms with Machin. Machin is indispensable and irreplaceable. I could get forty absolutely loyal secretaries while my wife was unsuccessfully searching for another Machin. "'I have an infallible way with parlour-maids,' said Miss Warburton. "'What is that?' "'I listen to their grievances and to their love affairs.' Mr. Prohack, though fatigued, felt himself to be inordinately well, and he divined that this felicity was due to the exercise of dancing on the previous night following upon the Turkish bath. He had not felt so well for many years. He laughed to himself at intervals as he performed his toilet, and knew not quite why. His secretary was just like a new toy to him, offering many of the advantages of official life and routine without any of the drawbacks. At half-past eleven he descended, wearing one or two of the more discreet of his new possessions, and with the sensation of having already transacted a good day's work, into the breakfast-room and found Miss Warburton and Machin in converse. Machin feverishly poked the freshly lit fire, and then, pretending to have urgent business elsewhere, left the room. Uh, "'Here are some particulars of a house in Manchester Square,' said Mr. Brohag. "'Please read them.' Miss Warburton complied. "'It seems really very nice,' said she. "'Very nice indeed.' "'Does it? Now listen to me. That house is apparently the most practical and the most beautiful house in London. Judging from the description, it deserves to be put under a glass case in a museum and labelled the ideal house. There is no fault to be found with that house, and I shall probably take it at once. But for one point. I don't want it. I do not want it. Do I make myself clear? I have no use for it, whatever. Then you've inspected it? I have not, but I don't want it. Now a determined effort will shortly be made to induce me to take that house. I will not go into details or personalities. I see merely that a determined effort will shortly be made to force me to act against my will and my wishes. This effort must be circumvented. In a word, the present is a moment when I may need the unscrupulous services of an utterly devoted confidential secretary. What am I to do? I haven't the slightest idea. All I know is that my existence must not on any account be complicated and that the possession of that house would be seriously complicated. "'Will you leave the matter to me, Mr. Brohack? "'What shall you do?' "'Wouldn't it be better for you not to know what I should do?' Miss Warburton glanced at him oddly. Her glance was agreeable, and yet disconcerting. The attractiveness of the young woman seemed to be accentuated. The institution of the confidential secretary was magnified in the eyes of Mr. Prohack, into one of the greatest achievements of human society. "'Oh, not at all,' said he in reply. "'You are underrating my capabilities, for I can know and not know simultaneously.' "'Well,' said Miss Warburton, "'you can't take an old house without having the drains examined, obviously. Supposing the report on the drains was unfavourable?' "'Do you propose to tamper with the drains?' "'Oh, certainly not. I shouldn't dream of doing anything so disgraceful.' "'But I must tamper with the surveyor who made the report on the drains.' "'Say no more,' Mr. Prohack adjured her. "'I'm going out.' And he went out, though he had by no means finished instructing Miss Warburton in the art of being his secretary. She did not even know where to find the essential tools of her calling, nor yet the names of tradesmen to whom she had to telephone. He ought to have stayed in if only to present his secretary to his wife. But he went out to reflect in private upon her initiative, her ready resourcefulness, her great gift for conspiracy. He had to get away from her. The thought of her induced in him qualms of trepidation. Could he, after all, manage her? What a loss would she be to Mr. Carroll Quire! Nevertheless, she was capable of being foolish. It was her foolishness that had transferred her from Mr. Carroll Quire to himself. 3. 
Mr. Prohack went out because he was drawn out by the force of an attraction which he could scarcely avow even to himself, a mysterious and horrible attraction which, if he had been a logical human being like the rest of us, ought to have been a repulsion for him. And as he was walking abroad in the pleasant foggy sunshine of the West End streets, a plutocratic idler with nothing to do but yield to strange impulses, he saw in the motor bus the placard of a financial daily paper bearing the line, THE LATEST OIL COUP. He immediately wanted to buy that paper. As a London citizen, he held the opinion that whenever he wanted a thing, he ought to be able to buy it at the next corner. Yet now he looked in every direction, but could see no symptom of a newspaper shop anywhere. The time was morning. At the West End it was early morning, and there were newsboys on the pavements, but by a curious anomaly they were selling evening and not morning newspapers. Daringly he asked one of these infants for the financial daily. The infant sniggered and did no more. Another directed him to a shop at an alley off the Edgware Road. The shopman doubted the existence of any such financial daily as Mr. Prohack indicated, apparently attaching no importance to the fact that it was advertised on every motor bus travelling along the Edgware Road. But he suggested that if it did exist, it might just conceivably be purchased at the main bookstall at Paddington Station. Determined to obtain the paper at all costs, Mr. Bragg stopped a taxicab and drove to Paddington, squandering eighteen pence on the journey, and reflecting as he rolled forward upon the primitiveness of a so-called civilization, in which you could not buy a morning paper in the morning without spending the whole morning over the transaction, and reflecting also upon the disturbing fact that after one full day of its practice, his scheme of scientific idleness had gone all to bits. He got the paper and read therein a very exciting account of Sir Paul Spinner's deal in oil lands. The amount of Paul's profit was not specified, but readers were given to understand that it was enormous, and that Paul had successfully bled the greatest oil combine in the world. The article, though discreet and vague in phraseology, was well worth a line on any placard. It had cost Mr. Prague the price of a complete Shakespeare, but he did not call it dear. He threw the paper away with a free, optimistic gesture of delight. Yes, he had wisely put his trust in old Paul, and he was veritably a rich man, one who could look down on mediocre fortunes of a hundred thousand pounds or so. Civilization was not so bad, after all. Then the original attraction which had drawn him out of the house resumed its pull. Why did his subconscious feet take him in the direction of Manchester Square? True, the Wallace collection of pictures is to be found at Hartford House, Manchester Square, and Mr. Brokack had always been interested in pictures. Well, if he did happen to find himself in Manchester Square, he might perhaps glance at the exterior of the dwelling which his son desired to plant upon him, and his wife desired him to be planted with. It was there right enough. It had not been spirited away in the night hours. He recognised the number. An enormous house the largest in the square after Hartford House. Over its monumental portico was an enormous sign, truthfully describing it as this noble mansion. As no automobile stood at the front door, Mr. Brown concluded that his wife's visit of inspection was over. Doubtless she was seeking him at home at that moment to the end of persuading him by her soft, unscrupulous arts to take the noble mansion. The front door was ajar. Astounding carelessness on the part of the caretaker. Mr. Brohack's subconscious legs carried him into the house. The interior was amazing. Mr. Brohack had always been interested not only in pictures, but in furniture. Pictures and furniture might have been called the weakness to which his circumstances had hitherto compelled him to be too strong to yield. He knew a good picture, and he knew a good piece of furniture when he saw them. The noble mansion was full of good pictures and good furniture. Evidently it had been the home of somebody who had both fine tastes and the means to gratify them. And the place was complete. Nothing had been removed, and nothing had been protected against the grimy dust of London. The occupiers might have walked out of it a few hours earlier. The effect of dark richness in the half-shuttered rooms almost overwhelmed Mr. Prohack. Nobody preventing he climbed the beautiful Georgian staircase, 
which was carpeted with a series of wondrous Persian carpets made end to end. A woman in a black apron appeared in the hall from the basement, gazed at Mr. Prowack's mounting legs, and said naught. On the first floor was the drawing-room, a magnificent apartment exquisitely furnished in Louis Quinze. Mr. Prowack blenched. He had expected nothing half so marvellous. Was it possible that he could afford to take this noble mansion and live in it? It was more than possible. It was sure. Mr. Brohack had a foreboding of a wild, tranting impulse to take it. The impulse died ere it was born. No further complications of his existence were to be permitted. He would fight against them to the last drop of his blood. And the complications incident to residence in such an abode would be enormous. Still, he thought he might as well see the whole house. And he proceeded upstairs wondering how many people there were in London who possessed the taste to make, and the money to maintain, such a home. Even the stairs from the first to the second floor were beautiful, having a lovely carpet, lovely engravings on the walls, and a delightful balustrade. On the second floor landing were two tables covered with objects of art, any of which Mr. Prackett might have pocketed, and nobody the wiser. The carelessness that left the place unguarded was merely prodigious. Mr. Brohack heard a sound. It might have been the creak of a floorboard or the displacement of a piece of furniture. Startled, he looked through a half-open door into a small room. He could see an old gilt mirror over a fireplace, and in the mirror the images of the upper portions of a young man and a young woman. The young woman was beyond question Sissy Prohack. The young man, he decided after a moment's hesitation, for he could distinguish only a male overcoated back in the glass, was Oswald Morphy. The images were very close together. They did not move. Then Mr. Brohack overheard a whisper, but did not catch its purport. Then the image of the girl's face began to blush. It went redder and redder, and the crimson seemed to flow downwards until the exposed neck blushed also. A marvellous and a disconcerting spectacle. Mr. Prohack felt that he himself was blushing. Then the two images blended, and the girl's head and hat seemed to be agitated as by a high wind, and then both images moved out of the field of the mirror. The final expression on the girl's face as it vanished was one of the most exquisite things that Mr. Prohack had ever witnessed. It brought the tears to his eyes. Nevertheless, he was shocked. His mind ran. That fellow has kissed my daughter, and he has kissed her for the first time. It is monstrous that any girl, and especially my daughter, should be kissed for the first time. I have not been consulted, and I have not the slightest idea that matters have gone so far. Her mother has probably been here with Charlie, and gone off leaving these doves together. Culpable carelessness on their part. Talk about mothers. No father would have been guilty of such negligence. The affair must be stopped. It amounts to an outrage. A peculiar person, Mr. Prohack. No normal father could have had such thoughts. Mr. Prohack could, of course, have burst in upon the pair and smashed an idol to fragments. But instead of doing so, he turned away from the idol and descended the stairs as stealthily as he could. Nobody challenged his exit. In the street he breathed with relief, as if he had escaped from a house of great peril. But he did not feel safe until he had lost himself in the populousness of Oxford Street. For social and family purposes, he reflected, I have not seen that kiss. I cannot possibly tell them, or tell anybody, that I spied upon their embrace. To put myself right, I ought to have called out a greeting the very instant I spotted them. But I did not call out a greeting. By failing to do so, I put myself in a false position. How shall I get official news of that kiss? Shall I ever get news of it? He had important business to transact with tradesmen. He could not do it. On leaving home he had not decided whether he would lunch domestically or at the Grand Babylon. He now perceived that he could do neither. He would lunch at one of his clubs. No, he could not bring himself to lunch at either club. He could face nobody. He resembled a man who has secretly carried a considerable parcel of high explosive. 
He wandered until he could wander no more, and then he entered a tea-shop that was nearly full of young girls. It was a new world to him. He saw mutton pie, eightpence on the menu, and ordered it haphazard. He discovered to his astonishment that he was hungry. Having eaten the mutton pie, he ordered a second one, and ate it. The second mutton pie seemed to endow the eater with the faculty of vision, a result which perhaps no other mutton pie had ever before in the whole annals of eating achieved. He felt much better. He was illuminated by a large, refreshing wisdom, which thus expressed itself in his exciting brain. After all, I suppose it's not the first or the only instance of a girl being kissed by a man. Similar incidents must occur quite often in the history of the human race. 4. When he returned home, his house seemed to be pitiably small, cramped, and lacking in rich ornament. It seemed to be no sort of a house for a man with twenty thousand a year. But he was determined to love his house at all costs, and never to leave it. The philosopher within himself told him that happiness does not spring from large houses built with hands. And his own house was bright that afternoon. He felt as soon as he entered it that it was more bright than usual. The reason was immediately disclosed. Sissy was inside it. She had come for some belongings and to pay a visit to her mother. "'My word!' she greeted her father in the drawing-room, where she was strumming, while Eve leaned lovingly on the piano. "'My word! We are fine with our new private secretary!' Not a sign on that girl's face, nor in her demeanour, that she had had an amorous secret, that something absolutely unprecedented had happened to her only a few hours earlier. The duplicity of women astonished even the philosopher in Mr. Prohack. "'Will she mention it, or won't she?' Mr. Prohack asked himself, and then began to equal Sissy in duplicity by demanding of his women, in a tone of raillery, what they thought of the new private secretary. He reflected that he might as well know the worst at once. "'She'll do,' said Sissy gaily, and Eve said, "'She seems very willing to oblige.' "'Ah!' Mr. Prohack grew alert. She's been obliging you already, has she? Well, said Eve, it was about the new house. What new house? But you know, darling, Charlie mentioned it to you last night, and I told you that I was going to look at it this morning. Oh, that! Mr. Brohack ejaculated disdainfully. I've seen it, I've been all over it, and it's simply lovely. I never saw anything equal to it. Of course. And so cheap. Of course. "'But it's ripping, Dad, seriously.' "'Seriously ripping, is it? "'Well, so far as I am concerned, I shall let it rip.' "'I rushed back here as soon as I'd seen it,' Eve proceeded, quietly ignoring the last remark. "'But you'd gone without, without saying where. "'Nobody knew where you'd gone. "'It was very awkward, because if we want this house we've got to decide at once, "'at latest in three days,' Charlie says. "'Miss uh, Warburton, that's her name, isn't it? Miss Warburton had a very bright idea. She seems to know quite a lot about property. She thought of the drains. She said the first thing would be to have the drains inspected, and that if there was any hurry the surveyors ought to be instructed instantly. She knew some surveyor people, and so she's gone out to see the agents and get permission from them for the surveyors to inspect, and she'll see the surveyors at the same time. She says we ought to have the report by tomorrow afternoon. She's very enterprising." The enterprisingness of Miss Warburton frightened Mr. Prohack. She had acted exactly as he would have wished, only better. Evidently she was working out his plot against the house in the most efficient manner. Yet he was frightened, so much so that he could find nothing to say except, Indeed. You never told me she used to be with Mr. Carroll Quire and is related to the Paul family, observed Eve, mingling a mild reproach with joyous vivacity as if saying, "'Why did you keep this tidbit from me?' "'I must now have a little repose,' said Mr. Prohack. "'We'll leave you,' Eve said, eager to be agreeable. "'You must be tired, you poor dear. "'I'm just going out to shop with Sissy. "'I'm not sure if I shall be in for tea, "'but I will be, if you think you'll be lonely.' "'Did you do much entertaining at lunch, young woman?' Mr. Prohack asked. Charlie had several people, men, but I really don't know who they were, and Ozzie Morphy came, and permit me to inform you that Charlie was simply knocked flat by my qualities as a hostess. Do you know what he said to me as afterwards? He said, 
that lunch was a bit of all right, kid. Enormous from Charlie, wasn't it? Mother and daughter went out arm in arm like two young girls. Beyond question they were highly pleased with themselves and the world. Eve returned after a moment. Are you comfortable, dear? I've told Machin you mustn't on any account be disturbed. Charlie's borrowed the car. We shall get a taxi in the Bayswater Road. She bent down and seemed to bury her soft lips in his cheek. She was beginning to have other interests than himself. And since she had nothing now to worry about in a maternal sense, she had become a child. She was fat, well, at any rate nobody could describe her as less than plump, and over forty. But a child, an exquisite child. He magnificently let her kiss him. However, he knew that she knew that she was his sole passion. She whispered most intimately and persuasively into his ear. "'Shall we have a look at that house to-morrow morning, just you and I? You'll love the furniture.' "'Perhaps,' he replied. What else could he reply? He very much desired to have a talk with her about Sissy and the young fellow Morphy, but he could not broach the subject because he could not tell her in cold blood that he had seen Sissy in Morphy's arms. To do so would have had an effect like setting fire to the home. Unless, of course, Sissy had already confided in her mother. Was it conceivable that Eve had a secret from him? It was certainly conceivable that he had a secret from Eve. Not only was he hiding from her his knowledge of the startling development of the relations between Sissy and Morphy, he had not even told her that he had seen the house in Manchester Square. He was leading a double life, consequence of riches. Was she? As soon as she had softly closed the door, he composed himself, for he was in fact considerably exhausted. Remembering a conversation at the club with a celebrated psychoanalyst about the possibilities of auto-suggestion, he strove to empty his mind, and then to repeat to himself very rapidly in a low murmur, "'You will sleep, you will sleep, you will sleep, you will sleep,' innumerable times. But the incantation would not work, probably because he could not keep his mind empty. The mysterious receptacle filled faster than he could empty it. It filled till it flowed over with a flooding realization of the awful complexity of existence. He longed to maintain its simplicity, well aware that his happiness would result from simplicity alone. But existence flatly refused to be simple. He desired love in a cottage with Eve. He could have bought a hundred cottages, all in ideal surroundings. The mere fact, however, that he was in a position to buy a hundred cottages somehow made it impossible for him to devote himself exclusively to loving Eve in one cottage. His imagination leaped over intervening events, and he pictured the wedding of Sissy as a nightmare of complications, no matter whom she married. He loathed weddings. Of course, a girl of Sissy's sense and modernity ought to insist on being married in a registry office. But would she? She would not. For a month previous to marriage all girls cast off modernity and became Victorian. Yes, she would demand real orange blossom and everything that went with it. He got as far as wishing that Sissy might grow into an old maid, solely that he might be spared the wearing complications incident to the ceremony of marriage as practised by intelligent persons in the twentieth century. His character was deteriorating, and he could not stop it from deteriorating. Then Sissy herself came very silently into the room. "'Sit down, my dear, I want to talk to you,' he said in his most ingratiating and sympathetic tones and in quite another tone he addressed her silently. "'It's time I taught you a thing or two, my wench.' "'Yes, father,' she responded, charming to his wily ingratiatingness, and sat down. "'If you were the ordinary girl,' he began, "'I shouldn't say a word. It would be no use. But you aren't, and I flatter myself I'm not the ordinary father. You are in love, or you think you are, which is the same thing for the present. It's a, it's a fine thing to be in love. I'm quite serious. I like you tremendously just for being in love. Yes, I do. Now, I know something about being in love. You've got enough imagination to realise that, and I want you to realise it. I want you to realise that I know a bit more about love than you do. That <laughs> stands to reason, doesn't it? Yes, father, said Sissy, placidly respectful. Love has got one drawback. It very gravely impairs the critical faculty. 
You think you could judge our friend Oswald with perfect impartiality. You think you see him as he is. But if you will exercise your imagination, you will admit that you can't. You perceive that, don't you? Quite, Dad, the adorable child concurred. Well, do you know anything about him, really? Not much, Father. Neither do I. I have nothing whatever against him, but I shouldn't be playing straight with you if I didn't tell you at the, at the club he's not greatly admired. And a club is a very good judge of a man, the best judge of a man. And then as regards his business, supposing you were not in love with him, should you like his business? You wouldn't, naturally. There are other things, but I won't discuss them now. All I suggest to you is that you should go a bit slow, exercise caution, control yourself, test him a little. If you and I weren't the greatest pals, I shouldn't be such an ass as to talk in this strain to you. But I know you won't misunderstand me. I know you know there's absolutely no conventional nonsense about me, just as I know there's absolutely no conventional nonsense about you. I'm perfectly aware that the old can't teach the young, and that oftener than not the young are right and the old wrong. But it's not a question of old and young between you and me. It's a question of two friends. That's all. "'Dad,' said she, "'you're the most wonderful dad that ever was. <laughs> oh, if everybody could talk like that!' "'Well, not at all, not at all,' he deprecated, delighted with himself and her. "'I'm simply telling you what you know already. Oh, I needn't say any more. You'll do exactly as you think best, and whatever you do will please me. I don't want you to be happy in my way. I want you to be happy in your own way. Possibly you'll decide to tell Mr. Morphy to—' wait for three months. "'I most decidedly shall, Dad,' Sissy interrupted him, "'and I am most frightfully obliged to you.' He had always held that she was a marvellous girl, and here was the proof. He had spoken with the perfection of tact and sympathy and wisdom, but his success astonished him. At this point he perceived that Sissy was not really sitting in the chair at all, and that the chair was empty so that the exhibition of sagacity had been entirely wasted. "'Anyhow, I've had a sleep,' said the philosopher in him. The door opened. Matron appeared, defying her mistress's orders. "'I'm sorry to disturb you, sir, but uh, Mr. Morphy's on the telephone and asks whether it would be convenient for you to see him to-night. He says it's urgent.' Mr. Prohack braced himself, but where his stomach had been there was a void. 5. "'Had an accident to your eyeglass?' asked Mr. Prohack, shaking hands with Oswald Morphy, when the latter entered, by appointment, Mr. Prohack's breakfast-room after dinner. Miss Warburton having gone home, Mr. Prohack had determined to employ her official room for formal interviews. With her woman's touch she had given it an air of business which pleasantly reminded him of the treasury. Ozzy was not wearing an eyeglass, and the absence of the broad black ribbon that usually ran like a cable connection between his eye and his supra-umbilical region, produced the disturbing illusion that he had forgotten an essential article of attire. Uh, uh, "'Yes,' Ozzy replied, opening his eyes with that mien of surprise that was his response to all questions, even the simplest. Uh, uh, "'Miss Sissy has cracked it.' "'I'm very sorry my daughter should be so clumsy.' "'It, it was not exactly clumsiness. I'm, I, I offered her the eyeglass to do what she pleased with, and then she pleased to break it.' "'Surely an impertinent.' Oh, no, 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 a, a favour. Uh, Miss Sissy did not care for my eyeglass. You must be considerably incommoded. No, 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 the purpose of my eyeglass was decorative and not optical. Ozzy smiled agreeably, though nervously. Mr. Brohack was conscious of a certain surprising sympathy for this chubby, simpering young man with the peculiar vocation, whom but lately he had scorned, and on one occasion he had described as a perfect ass. "'Well, shall we sit down?' suggested the elder, whom the younger's nervousness had put into an excellent state of easy confidence. "'The, the, the fact is,' said Ossie, obeying, the, "'the fact is I, I've come to see you about Sissy. I'm, I'm very anxious to marry her, Mr. Prohack.' "'Indeed. Then you must excuse this old velvet coat. If I'd had notice of the solemnity of your visit, my dear Morphia, I'd, I'd have met you in a dinner-jacket. May I just put one question?' "'Have you kissed Sissy already?' I, "'I... I have.' "'By force or by mutual agreement?' "'Neither.' 
She made no protest? No. The reverse, rather. Yes. Then why do you come here to me? Oh, to, to, to get your consent. I suppose you arranged with Sissy that you should come here? Oh, yes, I did. We thought it would be best if I came alone. Well, all I can say is that you are a very old-fashioned pair. I am afraid that you must have forgotten to alter your date, Calendar, when the twentieth century started. Let me assure you that this is not by any means the nineteenth. I admit that I only altered my own date, Calendar, this afternoon, and even then only as the result of a, an unusual dream. Uh, yes, said Ozzy politely, and he said nothing else. But it seemed to Mr. Brohack that Ozzy was thinking, This queer old stick is taking advantage of his position to make a fool of himself in his queer old way. Let us examine the circumstances, Mr. Prohack proceeded. You want to marry Sissy, therefore you respect her. Therefore you would not have invited her to marry unless you had been reasonably sure that you possessed the brains and the material means to provide for her physical and moral comfort, not merely during the next year, but till the end of her life. It would be useless, not to say impolite, for me to question you as to your situation and your abilities, because you are convinced about both. And if you failed to convince me about both, you would leave here perfectly sure that the fault was mine and not yours, and you would pursue your plans just the same. Moreover, you are a man of the world, far more a man of the world than I am myself, and you are unquestionably the best judge of your powers to do your duty towards a wife. Of course, some might argue that I, being appreciably older than you, and appreciably wiser than you, and that my opinion on vital matters is worth more than yours, but you know, perhaps I know too, that in growing old a man does not really become wiser. He simply acquires a different sort of wisdom. Whether it is a better or a worse sort, nobody can decide. All we know is that the extremely young and the extremely old are in practice generally foolish, which leads you nowhere at all. But looking at history we perceive that the ideas of the moderately young have always triumphed against the ideas of the moderately old and happily so, for otherwise there could be no progress. Hence the balance of probability is that, assuming you and I were to differ, you would be more right than I should be. But, 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 I, but I hope that we do not differ, sir, said Ozzy. Mr. Prowack found satisfaction in the naturalness, the freedom from pose, of Ozzy's diffident and disconcerted demeanour. His sympathy for the young man was increased by the young man's increasing consternation. Again, resumed Mr. Prohack, ignoring Ozzy's hope, take the care of Sissy herself. Sissy's education was designed and superintended by myself. The supreme aim of education should be to give sound judgment of the great affairs of life, and moral stamina to meet the crises which arrive when sound judgment is falsified by events. If I were to tell you that in my opinion Sissy's judgment of you as a future judge's husband was unsound, it would be equivalent to admitting that my education of Sissy had been unsound, and I could not possibly admit such a thing. Moreover, just as you are a man of the world, so Sissy is a woman of the world. By heredity and by natural character, she is sagacious, and she has acquainted herself with all manner of things as to which I am entirely ignorant. Nor can I remember any instance of her yielding from genuine conviction to my judgment when it was opposed to hers. From all which it follows, my dear Morphy, that your mission to me here this evening is a somewhat illogical, futile, and unnecessary mission, and that the missioner must be either singularly old-fashioned and conventional, or laughing in his sleeve at me. No, Mr. Brohack, with a nineteenth-century wave of the hand, deprecated Ozzy's interrupting protest. No, no, there is a third alternative, and I accept it. You desired to show me a courtesy. I thank you. "'Have you no questions to ask me?' demanded Ozzy. "'Yes,' said Mr. Prohack. "'How did you first make the acquaintance of my daughter?' "'Do you mean to say you don't know? Hasn't Sissy ever told you?' "'Never. What is more, she has never mentioned your name in any conversation until somebody else has mentioned it. Such is the result of my educational system and the influence of the time spirit.' "'Well, I'm dashed!' exclaimed Ozzy sincerely. "'I hope not, Morphy.' I hope not, if by dashed you mean damned. But it was the most wonderful meeting, Mr. Prohack, Ozzy burst out. 
and he was in such an enthusiasm that he almost forgot to lisp. "'You knew I was in M.I. in the war after my trench fever?' "'M.I., that is to say, Secret Service?' Y "'Yes, Secret Service, if you like. Well, well sir, I, I was doing some work in the East End in a certain foreign community, and I had to get away quickly, and so I jumped into a motor van that happened to be passing. That van was driven by Sissy.' "'An example of fact imitating fiction,' remarked Mr. Prohack, seeking, not with complete success, to keep out of his voice the emotion engendered in him by Ozzy's too brief recital. "'Now that's one question, and you've answered it brilliantly. My second and last question is this. Are you in love with Sissy?' "'Please, Mr. Prohack!' Ozzy half rose out of his chair. "'Or do you love her? The two things are very different.' "'I beg your pardons. I, I, I had quite grasp, said Ozzy, apologetically subsiding. I, I, I quite say you what you mean. I, I'm both. You're a wonder, Mr. Prohack murmured. Anyway, sir, I, I'm glad you don't object to our engagement. My dear Oswald, said Prohack in a new tone, do you imagine that after my daughter had expressed her view of you by kissing you, I could fail to share that view? You? you have a great opinion of Sissy, but I doubt whether your opinion of her is greater than mine. We shall now have a little whisky together. Ozzy's chubby face shone, as in his agreeable agitation he searched for the eyeglass ribbon when it was not there. Well, sir, said he, beaming, this interview had uh, not been at all like what I expected. Nor like what I expected either, said Mr. Prahack. But who can foresee the future? And he added to himself, could I foresee, when I called this youth a perfect ass, that in a very short time I should be receiving him, not unpleasantly, as a prospective son-in-law? Life is marvellous. At the same moment Mrs. Prohack entered the room. "'Oh!' cried she, affecting to be surprised at the presence of Ozzy. "'Wife,' said Mr. Prohack, "'Mr. Oswald Morphy had stunned you the honour to solicit the hand of your daughter in marriage. You are staggered.' "'How ridiculous you are, Arthur!' said Mrs. Prohack, and impulsively kissed Ozzy. 6. The wedding festivities really began the next evening with a family dinner to celebrate Sissy's betrothal. The girl arrived magnificent from the Grand Babylon, escorted by her lover, and found Mrs. Prohack equally magnificent, indeed more magnificent by reason of the pearl necklace. It seemed to Mr. Prohack that Eve had soon become quite used to that marvellous necklace. He had already had to chide her for leaving it about. Ozzy also was magnificent. Even lacking his eyeglass and ribbon, he was magnificent. Mr. Prohack, esteeming that a quiet domestic meal at home demanded no ceremony, had put on his old velvet, but Eve had sharply corrected his sense of values, so surely indeed that nobody would have taken her for the recent recipient of our marvellous necklace at his hands, and he had yielded to the extent of a dinner-jacket. Charlie had not yet come. Since the previous afternoon he had been out of town on mighty enterprises, but Sissy had seen him return to the hotel before she left it, and he was momently expected. Mr. Prohack perceived that Eve was treating Ozzy in advance as her son, and Ozzy was responding heartily, a phenomenon which Mr. Prohack, in spite of himself, found agreeable. Sissy showed more reserve than her mother towards Ozzy, but then Sissy was a proud thing, which Eve never was. Mr. Prohack admitted privately that he was happy. Yes, he was happy in the betrothal, and he had most solemnly announced and declared that he would have naught to do with the wedding beyond giving a marriage gift to his daughter, and giving his daughter to Ozzy. And when Sissy said that as neither she nor Ozzy had much use for the state of being merely engaged, the wedding would occur very soon, Mr. Prohack rejoiced at the prospect of the upset being so quickly over. After the emotions and complications of the wedding, he would settle down to simplicity, luxurious possibly, but still simplicity, the plain but perfect. And let his fortune persist in accumulating, well it must accumulate, and be hanged to it. "'But uh, what about getting a house?' he asked his daughter. "'Oh, we shall live in Ozzy's flat,' said Sissy. "'Won't it be rather small?' "'The smaller the better,' said Sissy. "'It will match our income.' "'Oh, my dear girl,' Eve protested, 
with a glance at Mr. Prohack to indicate that for the asking Sissy could have all the income she wanted. "'And I'll give you an idea,' Eve brightly added. "'You can have this house rent-free.' Sissy shook her head. "'Don't make so sure that they can have this house,' said Mr. Prohack. "'But, Arthur, you've agreed to go and look at Manchester Square, and it's all ready, excepting the servants. I've told that if you don't want less than seven servants, including one or two men servants, there's no difficulty about servants at all. I shall be very disappointed if we don't have the wedding from Manchester Square.' Mr. Brohack writhed, though he knew himself safe. Seven servants? Two man-servants? No. And again, no. No complications.' "'I shall only agree to Manchester Square,' said he, with firmness and solemnity, "'subject to the drains being all right. Somebody in the place must show a little elementary sagacity and restraint.' "'But the drains are bound to be all right.' "'I hope so,' said the deceitful father, "'and I believe they will be. But until we're sure, nothing can be done.' And he laughed satanically to himself. "'Haven't you had the report yet?' Sissy complained. Miss Warburton was to try to get hold of it to-night. A moment later, Machin, in a condition of high excitement due to the betrothal, brought in a large envelope, saying that Miss Warburton had just left it. The envelope contained the report of Mrs. Doy and Doy on the drains of the noble mansion. Mr. Brohack read it, frowned, and pursed his judicial lips. Uh, "'Read it, my dear,' he said to Eve. Eve read that Messrs. Doy and Doy found themselves unable, after a preliminary inspection, which, owing to their instructions to be speedy, had not been absolutely exhaustive, to satisfy the drains of the noble mansion. They feared the worst, but there was, of course, always a slight hope of the best, or rather the second best. They phrased it differently, but they meant that. In the meantime, they would await further instructions. Mr. Prohack reflected calmly. My new secretary is an adept of the first conspiratorial order. Eve was shocked into silence. Doy and Doy used very thick and convincing notepaper. The entrance of Charlie loosed her tongue. Charlie, she cried, the drains are all wrong. Look at this. And didn't you say the option expired tomorrow? Charlie read the report. Infernal rascals, he muttered. Who's doing is this? Who's been worrying about drains? He looked round accusingly. "'I have,' said Mr. Prohack bravely, but he could not squarely meet the boy's stern glance. "'Well, Dad, what did you take me for? Did you suppose I should buy an option on a house without being sure of the drains? My first act was to have the drains surveyed by Flockers, the first firm in London, and I've got their certificate. As for Doy and Doy, they're notorious. They want to start everybody else but themselves getting a commission on that house, and this—' he slapped the report. "'This is how they're setting about it.' Eve adored her son. "'You see,' he said victoriously to Mr. Prohack, who secretly trembled. "'I shall bring an action against Doy and Doy,' Charlie continued. "'I'll show the whole rascally thing up.' "'I hope you'll do no such thing, my boy,' said Mr. Prohack, foolishly attempting the grandiose. "'I most positively shall, Dad.' Mr. Prohack realised desperately that all was lost except honour, and he was by no means sure about even honour. End of chapter 15